the next panel speaker that we have coming up is uh, Tools from Seaborg Technologies. He is one of the visionaries uh, who deeply wants to change the world and truly make it a better place. Controversially enough, his mean of execution is nuclear power. So please join me here on stage. Uh, interesting enough about Tools is he's also one of the, uh, the names that you see on all the international VC dinners. So whenever there's a new VC in town, Seaborg Technologies is always on the list. Please, do tell us more. Okay. Yes, um, so I'm uh, Troel Schönfeld. I have a PhD in nuclear physics and I, I uh, I enjoy uh, free food at dinners. Um, I, um, <laughs> I'm also quite angry. Um, I'm angry because when I was uh, this high, I, um, I, I always asked what's going on with the world. And back then, the big discussion was that we were polluting too much and we had holes in the ozone layer and, and we were uh, putting out a lot of gases into the atmosphere. And in, uh, luckily in 92, we signed a big agreement, the Kyoto Agreement, that uh, we would stop putting uh, pollution into the atmosphere. It, uh, as it turns out, that didn't happen. But then we signed it again in, in the early thousands, and again in 2005 and 2008 and 2015. And uh, luckily everybody is talking about now, we were talking about the same thing in, in 2015, that now it's time to act. Um, and I, I remember that discussion from the 90s too. So it's always been the time to act and still nobody is acting and you just see more and more CO2 being released into the uh, atmosphere. And not a lot of people realize it, but with the corona, we stopped flying and uh, industries are going bankrupt, including the oil industry, which has major problems. And yet we will put more CO2 into the atmosphere this year than we did last year, which is uh, some achievement, unfortunately not a good one. So with all of that anger, um, we were a bunch of physicists uh, brewing beer and uh, getting good enough at the beer that we founded a company to try to do something when nobody else is. And um, we founded Seaborg Technologies. And our target is to develop a new type of nuclear power plant. But before uh, talking too much about the nuclear power plant, we need to realize that when we're talking about this problem that we need to solve the, the global uh, uh, warming issues, there are also other issues on this planet, for example, poverty. Today, only one billion people have enough electricity uh, and uh, a few billion people doesn't have electricity at all. So these are also problems we need to solve, especially because electricity often is connected to clean water and, and food. Um, so you cannot expect these people to stay poor. So we are looking uh, in particular at Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, they have this interesting issue that it's on equator, so there's almost no wind power or no wind at all. And uh, they have clouded days because it's in a jungle region. So, so um, luckily they are stopping being a jungle region because they're cutting down all the woods to produce uh, biomass for, for Europe. But um, they cannot rely on solar or wind. And they don't have any big rivers uh, because it's island communities and, and they don't have a lot of geothermal and they have too high population density to rely on biomass themselves. So basically their choice is, do you want to stay poor or do you want to exploit coal, gas or nuclear? Nuclear of those options is by far the uh, most expensive. It takes the longest and it delivers a whole lot of energy into a grid which is not prepared for it. So it doesn't really work. So that's the problem we tried to, we're trying to solve. And um, I've brought with me here a couple of pieces of fluoride salt. And you can buy the, these in, in different hippie stores. And if you look at uh, what the healing homepages around the world says, it says it's really good for your spirituality. But then if you ask a physicist, he will say that it's also really, really good for nuclear reactors. And that's my opinion. Um, fluoride salts is basically a rock in nature. And we can melt it at around 500 degrees Celsius. When we do that, we can dissolve uh, nuclear fuel into it. And we can pump this uh, liquid into a reactor core and generate a lot of energy. The magic is not in the energy production. The magic is in when it doesn't work. If somebody drops by and, and bombs the plant or whatever, and this gets out of the reactor, all of these dangerous elements that are created when you make en uh, energy from nuclear, they are caught by the salt in the salt. So if it gets out, even doing a bombing, it just solidifies and stays as a rock. 
So instead of the nuclear power plants today, where you have a gas cloud coming out, which you breed and, and is a risk to your health, this is only, well, you would have to put up a fence and don't let your uh, kids play on the grounds, but it's something you can clean up, which is very, very different from conventional nuclear reactors. And with this salt, we, we have built a design which cannot be used for nuclear weapons, which turns out to be really important in Southeast Asia, and which um, cannot melt down or explode. And even if you bomb it, this will not go anywhere. Um, and which can burn waste from existing nuclear reactors. And also, which can be built on ships and shipped from the industrial countries where we can build into these poor regions to supply electricity. And that's, that's the uh, fundamental concept here. So over the last few years, we have found investors and we have grown a team of 30 people from, from all around the world. And I think it's, it's clear when you want to do a nuclear reactor startup, it's something that is really, really hard. And a lot of people out there think that when something is hard, it means that it costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. If that is true, then we have a problem with the cri uh, climate crisis. Uh, but I, I don't think it's true. I think when something is really, really hard, then it means that you need an absolutely outstanding team to solve the problem. And that there's obviously some risk. So we need to be risk willing and we need to go for it and we need the right people to look at the problems. And then I think we can actually solve a lot of the big issues we have on this planet. So we have made a big effort in getting people from all around the world here. And these are all extraordinary talents um, that, that is working hard every day on solving this. Um, and our big plan, which we have been, uh, been trying to execute over the last few years, is to um, use the existing heavy industry in, in South Korea to manufacture these plants on, on, in series on shipyards and then tuck these ships to, to the uh, poor harbors of Southeast Asia. In particular, in the region where the, uh, the logistics is very poor, where you don't have roads. Today, it's a nightmare to build energy because you need energy before you can build the roads and you need the roads before you can build energy. So it's really hard to access these poor people and, and uh, deliver electricity. But when you come from the seaside, most large cities are placed on shore or near a big river. So when you come from the seaside, you can throw a cable up on the docks and start to deliver electricity and expand your grid and your logistics systems from there. And also, just to, as a last word here, um, the challenge at hand is pretty massive. And when we look at Southeast Asia, you can look at what is the maximum production we could produce, uh, how many of these units could we produce in South Korea, how much money is on the move in Southeast Asia, and what is the plant scaling of coal and gas. It turns out that China and Singapore is, is moving uh, or mobilizing 3 trillion US dollars to install coal, gas, and other energy sources into the Southeast Asian grid uh, until 2040. That's a massive amount of electricity. Southeast Asia is almost a billion people. And to put that in context, we have a billion people today with enough electricity. We need to double the amount of energy used on this planet to, give, to get these people out of poverty. And in that process, they can only use coal and gas today. So it's something that needs to be done. And we believe we can actually replace most of this coal and gas new build with nuclear reactors. So that's our target. And then uh, I will have some time for questions, if there is any. There's none. <laughs> I love my iPad. Just need to Probably it's likely that nobody has questions. Well, if no one else, then at least I have. No one popped up. <laughs> Ooh, here we go. Uh, what are the main risks in comparison with current nuclear solutions? That's a good question. I mean, obviously, this is something new. And when you do something new, um, there's a lot of risk associated with it. Um, one could argue that we haven't done anything new in the nuclear industry uh, since the 50s or maybe early 60s. So, so innovation is a big thing there too, making the risk even bigger. In, in our case, I think we will do, uh, we'll make reactors that are much cheaper than all the 
other designs. So I don't really see nuclear as a competitor here. I, I see my competitors coal and gas, but um, uh, the risk here is on the development and first deployment and all of these things. So obviously a lot of risk, which is why we are startup. <laughs> True. And what's coming up? Are you working with the communities to ensure cultural collaboration? Ooh, that's uh, that's a hard one. Um, well, actually, it's someone that studied from Ross University and trying to save Africa, um, yeah, yeah, international yeah, yeah. development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, probably not enough. Um, as I said, we have a lot of people from from a lot of cultures, um, and we do collaborate with, uh, for example, Korea and other Southeast Asian. Mm -hmm. um, countries so we do collaborate with the uh, with foreign entities mm -hmm. and we have a lot of foreigners um and i think we as a company embrace that culture mm. and make it a strong side that we have all of these different opinions and also take some of the strong sides from different cultures and try to implant implement in our culture but but unfortunately we don't collaborate too much with the community <laughs> on this that's fair um how so you speak talking about like a diverse team how big an effort is that? Like, how much on purpose have you kind of designed a diverse team? It's a really good question. Um, I, I really, I when we started this, uh, when we were doing the first hires, I really wanted to hire for diversity. Yeah. And then I figured out that I don't think it's a favor to anybody to be hired for diversity. So we've consistently hired the best people for the job, but. Um, we're not afraid of diversity, mm -hmm. which I think is important. And then you automatically get a diverse team. Um, and obviously that goes for some parameters, but not for others. So there's a lot of parameters to be diverse in. But diversity is both mindset and all of these common... Uh, exactly, exactly. Um, just one thing, it's because I know that there's a great interest for diversity <laughs> amongst the audience. And since there's 1,500 of them sitting out there... I yeah, would then I hope we will in the next hiring round have more diverse... Uh, uh, talents. <laughs> there you go. But like you said yourself, diversity is is broad, right? It can be age, it can be um, uh, opinion and perspectives, uh, it can be uh, different uh, backgrounds, um, it can be uh, people with a handicap. Uh, what what is like the most interesting diverse thing f about your team? Uh, there's a lot of interesting <laughs> diverse things about our team. Um, I don't know. We have some good oddballs, but that's l easy when you come from physics. And I like that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We have time for one more question. Um, how far, in terms of time, are you from getting your first deployment? If we can stay on plan, we will have first power to the grid in mm -hmm. 2025. So that's in five years. That, um, that seems like a long time for uh, in the startup community. but. This the the sale will happen before then as one thing and mm -hmm. the other thing is that in the energy market five years is really really a short time usually wi if you s if you put the money on the table today to build a new wind park mm. then it will not be there in 2025 so so uh, it's a, that's a very short timeline line in the energy market but a very long timeline in the startup uh, mm -hmm. environment. Thank you for the explanation because I think I was not the only one who needed <laughs> a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I would have loved to give you a great applause, but uh, I'm asking people to do it on social media instead. So okay, what, is, uh, what is the preferred uh, platform of Seaborg Technologies? S search for us on Facebook on Seaborg Technologies. And Seaborg Technologies on Facebook. Facebook. Exactly. Big applause and like to Seaborg. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers.